does, but the light also, uh, it turns out that the light which is radiated, although it separates from the star, it's still in some sense, well, the shell of light emitted from the star at any one point becomes separated from the star, because of course the light is moving outward from the star at the speed of light, but nevertheless shrinks and does not exit the black hole. Ah, excellent question. The answer is, let me just draw you a, well, actually, let's save that question for the end of my lecture today, or perhaps the end of my lecture tomorrow. Because it will be easier, once I have given you a nice pictorial description of a black hole, and then I will simply draw the answer for you on the picture. An excellent question. Excellent question. I guess the, I'll give you the short version. No, I'll give you the short version now. <laughs> the short version is that it turns out that in quantum field theory, one can have, at least for short periods of time in some sense, well, actually for long periods of time in cases like this, one can have negative energy. It turns out it comes out. And that's what happens here. So it turns out that in some sense, the description of this Hawking process is that outside the horizon, what you might have thought was the vacuum separates into positive and negative energy bits. The negative energy flows across the horizon, causes the black hole to shrink. The positive energy flows outward towards infinity. And thus, in some sense, the stuff that arrives at infinity was never inside the black hole. It was, on, it was only those positive energy pieces that were, short, that were just outside the horizon. On the other hand, at least as we understand physics today, no one has a useful concept for what it would mean to have negative information. So we can't use the same trick to get out of what's often called the information paradox. Yes? What are you looking for? Because um, when we witness information being converted into just energy, and effectively being destroyed by just being converted into energy all the time? Well, not, not in detail. We usually believe that this is an artifact of what people in thermodynamics or stat would call coarse graining, a rough description of the world. Right? There's this standard example, which I'll just briefly remind you of, that suppose one has not a black hole, but a box with some atoms in it, okay? Then a standard example of thermodynamics is that, okay, maybe I start with all the atoms piled up in a corner. And maybe this encodes some information, because I use this to, st to you know, store some number. I have four options here, one, two, three, four, and this says it's one instead of two, three, or four. Okay. Then, of course, what happens, if this is a gas at finite temperature, is that these atoms will quickly spread themselves more or less evenly over the box. And so in that sense, if one, in that sense, the atoms are no longer concentrated in the corner, so in some sense, the information has disappeared. Okay? And that's the sense of what you're talking about, really. On the other hand, we know here that in principle, if we made ridiculously precise measurements of all the atoms, and if there was absolutely no interaction with the outside world, we could use the time reversibility of, the, of Newton's laws or the unitarity of quantum mechanics to evolve backwards and find out that all these atoms came from the small corner. So in that sense, the information here has not completely disappeared. It is merely hard to find. Okay? Whereas, usually, when one talks about causality, as I'll describe in a little bit more detail in a minute, um, if something is so far away from you, for example, that if there's an event that occurs very far away from you, and not enough time has passed for a light signal to travel to you, then the standard story is that there is no way, even in principle, that you could reconstruct that event. And it turns out a black hole, as traditionally described, as described in classical general relativity, is very much like that second story. Okay? So it, it's, it, I agree it's a subtle difference, very subtle difference, but it's the difference between can you in principle run the atoms backwards, and can you in principle tell what's going on farther away than C times T. EPR doesn't transmit information. Nope. EPR doesn't, this is, this is a, a, a side discussion, but um, uh, uh, it's a, a lovely and old story from quantum field theory is that despite the fact that EPR contains in some sense non-local correlations, it cannot be used to transmit information faster than the speed of light. So it respects the story. Okay. Yeah? Uh, did I think you mention that most physicists believe that the information is encoded in Hawking relations in the black hole? Or did I misunderstand? That's what I said. I think that's true. This, this, is a, this, I believe, is true because string theorists almost all believe that, and they dominate other, other physicists just due to their number. Right. Right. But I still find it very, very difficult to believe if I take all the 
Oh, I didn't say that I believe this. Oh, you don't believe this. Well, I, I, I'm actually an agnostic on this question, as I may have time to discuss later. Okay. Um, you know, if I take the encyclopedia and encyclopedia and throw it into the black hole, how yes. does it come out the I don't know, and no one is able to tell me in detail, and therefore, I consider this an open question. So ag agnostic is not quite the right word. I certainly care what the answer is. Mm -hmm. But um, I, it, it's, it, it remains plausible to me that the answer could go either way. Okay. Both, I think, would require some new story about physics. Right. All right, so we'll try to come back to that later. Okay. But this is all a, a long story. And as I said, I wanted to start with something simple. Um, I'm told that there's a wide variety of backgrounds here. That people have different amounts of exposure to general relativity and so forth. And so my primary goal for the first lecture, or perhaps the first two lectures, is in fact just to give you a basic idea of what a black hole is. Okay. So uh, actually, I've written two lectures, which one, the first one I call Black Hole Basics. And the second one I call Black Hole Thermodynamics. Now, despite the fact that I've only written two lectures so far, the organizers have given me thermodynamics. Okay. The organizers have given me three slots. And this is good because probably each of these lectures is too long to fit in an hour. Okay. In fact, it may well be true that especially if you folks ask questions, as I encourage you strongly to do, that all three of the lectures will basically be used in finishing up step one. And that's perfectly fine with me because, as I say, I think understanding at least at an intuitive level, what a black hole is, is perhaps the most important thing you can gain out of my set of talks. I can always leave the material in the second lecture, and any further lectures, for, the, for homework problems for you folks to do in the workshop after I leave. Okay. I'm serious. The, the, the last part is actually more straightforward than the first part, even though it's more advanced. All right, but today, uh, wake up and pay attention. Um, this lecture I have tried to design so that people who know no general relativity whatsoever can follow it. So if you're in that category, you know, sit up. Nevertheless, um, I hope the presentation is different from what you've seen. For those of you who know general relativity, I hope the presentation is different enough that you still get a quite a bit out of this. So I hope everyone will follow along and find something useful from this talk. All right. So we begin. Where do I begin? Hmm. Well, I'm not going to assume any general relativity, but obviously I have to assume you know something. So I'll assume that you're all familiar with Minkowski space. Okay. Which, as we know, has the property that if you compute a proper distance squared in Minkowski space, it's given by, in Cartesian coordinates, minus the change in time squared plus the change in distance squared. Okay, just a check. Is this familiar to all or most of you? No? Oh, well. <laughs> Let me get a brief survey. I may have to redesign the future lectures. Just out of curiosity, uh, how, many, how many of you is this familiar? How many of you are familiar with this? OK, about half. Uh, for those of you who, how many of you have some exposure to special relativity? OK, but not in this form. Interesting. OK. Um, so, so let me just, just try to catch everyone up for a minute, um, do this on the fly. For someone who has never seen this equation before, please tell me what you think is the most fundamental equation of special relativity, and then I'll try to translate to this. Uh, let's see, if I wrote this one, if I wrote... Okay, if I wrote this and called it a time dilation formula, how many of you have seen that before? Okay, good, 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 okay, good, good. So, let me just take two minutes to translate between this and this. Okay, that'll hope to help to catch you folks up. So, it turns out that when some of you learn special relativity, you were taught a large number of complicated looking formulas like this. Perhaps with even extra terms. Perhaps that had things that looked like this in them. Whatever. Okay. It, well, if I do the full Lorentz transformation, I get some extra terms. Actually, it moves, maybe it's this way, I forget. But anyway, there are various complicated equations that one can learn in special relativity. It turns out, however, that almost all of the physical content of special relativity is encapsulated here in this equation. And what does this mean? 
On the right-hand side, we have something involving changes in coordinates. Whereas on the left-hand side, we have what I will just, for the very first short path, pass, described as physical measurements. In particular, delta S here is what is known as the proper length, uh, no, proper distance, shoot, between two events. So what that means is, I mean, you're familiar with the idea that in special relativity, the distances between events or the time separation between events depends on who makes the measurements, which observer measures the quantity, right? Okay. The term proper here means that we choose, really, the most natural observer to make this measurement. So here, we will take two events and we'll consider the distance between them in a reference frame in a reference frame uh, for which the events uh, happen at the same time. For any two events far enough apart, there is exactly one reference frame where they occur at the same time, and we call the distance between them in that reference frame the proper distance. So it turns out it turns out that this equation allows you to calculate the proper distance. Let's see if I can do this here. Suppose, for example, we have, let me draw, let's see. Let me draw what's called a space-time diagram, where I draw time in this direction and space in this direction. And let me suppose. that I choose two arbitrary events, which are fairly far apart, then they're separated by some distance, delta x, and some time, delta t. And if I ask you, what is the distance between these events as measured by an observer who believes the two events happen at the same time or are simultaneous, the answer is given not by the usual Pythagorean theorem, but instead by that equation. The answer is that delta S is equal to the square root of delta X squared minus delta T squared. Okay. Similarly, if I were to consider two events which are, not, which are separated more vertically than horizontally, for example, suppose I had some moving observer and I wanted to consider two events on that observer's world line, then again, there's a separation in delta t, there's a separation in delta x, oops, delta x. But if I want to know what's called the proper time between these two events, the proper time is the time measured by the observer that actually passes through the two events. In other words, the proper time is exactly the amount of time that's measured on the watch of the observer that moves between these two points. Okay. That's also given by a similar kind of formula. Um, to get proper time, let's see, proper time we'll call delta tau. And it turns